only one of these names actually refers to the devil. The devil is a complex character to study at the best of times, but with some investigation, I have located the artist who was key to establishing the nature of the devil himself. Hello, detective! Not now, Lucifer, I'm not having you cutting across another lecture. Or staging a Chippendale striptease whilst I'm talking about art. I'm watching you. But actually, this is an important point for today's piece, because when I say Lucifer, anyone with a Netflix subscription thinks of this... Are you blind? But when I say the devil, you probably think of something more like this. This painting is an illustration of Canto 34 of the Inferno, the first book of Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy. It was painted by Sandro Botticelli in the mid-1480s on the commission of Lorenzo de Pier Francesco de' Medici. These illustrations are designed to accompany the printed version of the book, but they were never finished. Only four of them were ever illuminated like this. Still, the ones that do exist hide a secret. As I said, the key to the nature of the devil himself. But I'm a creep. I'm a widow. Shut up, Morningstar. Let's take a look at the drawings. There are 92 in total that accompany the original manuscript of Dante's Divine Comedy. Of these, the most famous are probably the map of hell, seen here, and his depiction of the devil, the one I showed you earlier. It's worth noting the gorgeous intricacy of what's on the page here. After all, this is the painter of the birth of Venus we're talking about. Botticelli was famous for elaborate art, but it's taken to extremes here. The detail present in the map of the Inferno is breathtaking. Each individual level and person picked out with painstaking precision. Looked at closely, you can see that the design also forms a spiral out of the rings of hell, drawing the eye of the beholder deeper down to its waiting depiction of the devil at its very base. It's telling a story through that picture. The Inferno is about one man's descent through hell to reach purgatory and then later paradise. For those not familiar, Dante Alighieri writes the Inferno with himself as the main character, taken on a whirlwind tour of the afterlife by his patron, the genius poet Virgil, writer of the Aeneid. The two also follow the character of Beatrice, an angelic figure who, believe it or not, is based on a real person, Bice de Folco Portinari, one of Dante's old crushes from Florence. Poets used to call them muses back in the day. The pair descend through the nine circles of hell shown on the painting here. Each circle is dedicated to a different sin committed in life, often with a suitably ironic punishment. For instance, in the eighth circle, that's right down at the bottom, third ring after the big rock ledge, you can see this bunch of legs sticking in the air. Those are people being punished for simony, or the sin of selling positions within the church for money. They're buried like that because they turned their eyes away from God to focus on the material world. In the text, Dante also tells us their feet are scorched with tongues of flame. See, Botticelli's real trick here lies in that spiral structure, the telling of the story without words. If you look at the shape at the top, it's slanted to accentuate the spiral on the page, drawing the eye downwards. Essentially, Botticelli's created a chapter page using only the shape of the rings. You're able to see what's ahead of you simply by following his drawings, picking out the chapters one by one to the bottom. That kind of detail only comes from a love of the source material, and Botticelli wasn't alone in that. Remember, the commissioner of this work was Lorenzo da Pier Francesco de' Medici. Anyone with even a mild acquaintance with Florentine history will know the name Medici, as will anybody who's played Assassin's Creed II. The Medici are one of the most infamous and wealthy criminal families in history. They basically ran the city of Florence, in particular the banking system, and they engaged in a mixture of blackmail, bribery and outright murder to keep power. One of them even managed to become Pope for a while. Which is a little ironic, considering that without the conflict that inspired Dante's passage on Simony, that almost certainly wouldn't have happened. The actual books of the Divine Comedy were written more than 200 years before these paintings were ever drawn. Dante had been cast out of his native Florence by a conflict between two important political groups, the Black and White Guelphs. To cut a long story very short, the Black Guelphs backed the total power of the Pope, whilst the White Guelphs thought that Florence should have more independence. Dante roamed the country as a travelling poet, surviving on sponsorships from wealthy donors. He wrote the Inferno in mourning for his beloved city and what it had become. Whole passages were dedicated to the greed of the church under then-pope Boniface VIII. Dante's hatred for Boniface 
even extends into the text itself. He goes so far as to put Nicholas III, a previous pope, into the eighth circle of hell I described earlier. Buried head down in the earth, Nicholas can't see who's just approached him, so he mistakes Dante for Boniface and calls out, Boniface, is that you? You'll be here soon. So in his poem, Dante put not one, but two popes in hell. I know what you're thinking, how the hell was this guy not burned at the stake? I'm sure Boniface would have loved to, but the answer here is popularity. Dante's depiction of hell, whilst being largely made up for the Inferno, was so popular that large portions of Italy started to take it as gospel truth. So much so that 200 years later, it was basically being treated as the standard description of hell by most of Italy's population. We still do it today when you think about it. The circles of hell are referenced all the way through our social media with a level of certainty you'd expect of biblical quotations, not self-insert fanfiction, which, let's face it, that's what the Inferno basically is. How does that fit into Botticelli's painting and the nature of the devil himself? Allow me to explain. Whilst books in general were becoming more common after the invention of the printing press, for something to be printed in a book lent it legitimacy. For it to be included in an illustrated manuscript, even more so. These would either be included in private collections or in libraries used by scholars. Almost exclusively, those were run by the church at this point in history. So Lorenzo has basically asked Botticelli to lend the credibility of one of Florence's most famous artists and one of Florence's most powerful citizens to a work that forefronts the criminality of his family. In particular, one of its most influential members. It's like a crime lord turning around and saying this. Hey Louis, you do art, right? Sure boss, why? I wants to make a picture, Louis. Okay boss. I'm thinking we should do an illustrated version of the report that journalist guy did. The one we dropped in the river for looking up your tax returns, boss? The very same. And I think you should do pictures of all them tax receipts he stole, but in color. Don't you think that's kind of incriminating, boss? I'm thinking I don't pay you to use five-syllable words, Louis. You got it, boss. The thing is, by the time Botticelli and Lorenzo were considering this, the Divine Comedy was so much a part of Catholic mythology as to be almost indistinguishable from the original, like those names I used for Lucifer at the start, or even Botticelli's presentation of him in this picture. The horns and the fangs aren't there in the Bible, that's all depictions of Pan and Dionysus. Now, that knowledge isn't new, but in putting it into print and onto a manuscript, Botticelli is turning it into established culture. He's also revolutionizing a particular style of art in order to do that. See, Botticelli matches each of these illustrations to a canto or a section of the story. He tells the whole story of each canto in the pictures. This means he has to collapse the passage of time to tell several events in one picture. You can see it happen in the art. Beatrice, Dante and Virgil all appear multiple times in the same image, acting out different parts of the canto. So he's telling a story through pictures, supported by writing, where the narrative is spread out in a single set of combined images throughout the page. Where have we seen that before? Oh yeah. The perpetuation of culture through images and stories, all written down with additions to create a more satisfying narrative. Here to elucidate, we have the author of the original comic Lucifer, Neil Gaiman. Hang on, you're not Neil. Sorry, boys and girls, Neil couldn't make it. He's a bit tied up at the moment. <laughs> Allow me to take over, your favorite clown prince of crime. He actually explained the whole process to me. Well, I got most of it through the ball gag. <laughs> We're old friends. See, according to my pal Neil, all stories are essentially changed in the telling. So much so that over a series of years and retellings, a story can change so much, you wouldn't even recognize it. Oh, sort of like Satan going from a mutated fawn to Tom Ellis. Exacto mundo! And if you interrupt me again, I'll introduce you to Harleen's mallet. Now, I'm rather fond of this theory. After all, I retell the story of how I got this luscious green hairdo all the time. I mean, if I have to have a past, I'd prefer it to be multiple choice. <laughs> you know, that's what happened to old Lucy. Retold and remade and repackaged down through the years until that hack Neil gets a hold of it. Without that original, though, the popularity wouldn't have spread. 
I mean, it's all got to start somewhere. If old Lorenzo hadn't commissioned that work, then no illustrated devil, no pictorial storytelling with text, no penny dreadfuls in the Victorian age, no funny books in the fifties, and guess, no me. How would you live with yourselves? So, without the innovations Botticelli uses in those paintings, we wouldn't have comic books. Oh, I'm sure some sad sack would have invented it sometime, but it's all got to start somewhere. And for me, it all started here. Anyways, got a dash, I've got the boy Blunder hanging over a fish tank of sharks back home. I just love their little smiles. To Lou! <laughs> Well, there you have it from the most evil man in the world, Botticelli's Inferno, the birth of an art form that would shape the foundations of modern culture to this day, and it all started with Lucifer. What desires drive a man such as yourself? Not that one. Thanks for watching, guys. If you've got any art you'd like us to review, or perhaps you've noticed the birth of another legend in classical art, let us know in the comments below, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the little bell icon if you'd like to hear more from us about art in the future. For now, it's been great to share with you, and I'll see you in the next video.